So uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, or good evening, uh, as it may well be for some, for some of you uh, not in the, in the UK. So welcome to the uh, 2020 UAS Challenge uh, Award Ceremony. Uh, I'm uh, Paul Lloyd, I'm the chair of the challenge, uh, and I'll be uh, helping you through this uh, virtual uh, award ceremony this afternoon. Got lots to pack in, uh, some interesting videos uh, to see, as well as some prize winners. Um, as you're aware, and, you, and you've probably seen on the slides, we, we again, we had a, another excellent participation at this year's challenge. 36 teams from universities throughout the world. Um, however, as we all know, uh, it's been a very difficult uh, and challenging period the last few months. Uh, and therefore, we've had to uh, to move to, to a virtual environment and able to have the fire event this year. Uh, and I'd just like to say thank you very much to all of you uh, for all the teams and the sponsors and the supporters for enduring through these very difficult times and helping us to, to be able to move this challenge forward uh, and get to this, this event ceremony this afternoon. We've had some, again, some very high quality entrants, uh, some very high quality uh, design work uh, and paperwork and, and so design submitted to us, which, so unfortunately we couldn't see the, the real things um, in person, we would have been there now, uh, but, but um, again, hopefully we'll talk about that next year uh, and see where we get to. In terms of this year's uh, the ceremony, um, Shortly, I'll be handing over to uh, Terry Spall, who is the president of the IMAP, uh, to give a, a keynote speech. And then uh, after that, Lambert Doppen, uh, happens all, uh, the chief judge, well, head judge, will, will give an, uh, a view from the judge experience. Following that, we'll step through the various prizes, and we have some videos, uh, and some Dragon Ball videos well, amongst that to, to uh, the great uh, Towards the end, uh, Joe Horton uh, will give the closing remarks for y Yelena, uh, we'll do a vote of thanks from the, uh, from the organising committee, uh, and then I'll close the event up at four o'clock. Uh, you're all muted, um, uh, I'm afraid, so we won't be able to hear you. However, so if you've got any comments or questions, uh, please, you'll see on your on your side there, there's a QA and a box. Please pop any comments or questions you've got in, in there, and we'll do our best to pick them up and pick them up through the event. Uh, certainly, any thoughts or comments you have on the, on the whole event itself are always most welcome. Please put them in. Uh, this event's recorded, so we can we can look back, back at those comments and, and reflect upon them. So, so please do. That's always useful. We always welcome your feedback. And at the end, I'll give a little bit more details about where we are, our plans for the competition uh, for next year. But let's this year now focus on this year's. And I'll hand over now to uh, to Terry Paul, who is the uh, the president of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. Terry, over to you. So, uh, well, good afternoon to you all, and thank you, Paul, for the, uh, the introduction. Uh, as you heard, I'm Terry Spall. I'm the, uh, the 135th president uh, of the IMICI. And for me, like the 134 that went before me, uh, it's a great honour. And to be honest, it, it's one of the highlights of the role to be asked to, to join an awards event such as this, which recognises engineering excellence and which promotes, um, let's say, competitive challenge and, and team spirit. So before I delve into the, the competition and, and talking about that, I'd like to uh, just take the opportunity, I think it'd be remiss of me not to uh, briefly tell you a little bit about what's currently going on in the institution. Uh, it, is, uh, it is for us, like many organisations, developing into uh, quite a tough year, uh, but we are prevailing and we won't flounder and we will emerge from uh, coronavirus in, uh, in hopefully good shape. Um, our governing body, the, the trustee board, uh, supported by our council and working hand in glove with our staff teams, have been navigating some fairly choppy waters, to be honest, and taking some tough decisions and trying to keep as much as possible in a business as usual state. Um, our fantastic headquarters building, number one, Birdcage Walk in London, has been shut down <laughs> for quite some weeks now since the start of the lockdown period. Uh, but we are hopeful it will re it'll be reopening next month. Um, the majority of the team, uh, that is both uh, staff and members, uh, have still been working, working from home to keep the show on the road. And to be honest, I'm doing a great job. I'm very, very proud of them. Uh, we managed to get through our annual election. You may have heard if you're Amici members and perhaps even you even voted uh, last month. And I'm very fortunate now in having a very strong trustee board uh, already working long hours um, to move our agenda forward and plan for the future. And I'm sure it will resonate with, with many of you when I speculate that, uh, that perhaps post-COVID life will almost certainly be quite different to pre-COVID life. And our acceptance and, and reliance on virtual communication and engagement and flexible approaches to working are perhaps here to stay. Uh, and that could be a real positive to emerge from, to be honest, such a negative situation. We certainly live in interesting times, there's no doubt about that. 
Anyway, today is uh, is all about uh, something we hold very dear. Uh, the Unmanned Aircraft Systems, or UAS Challenge, is one of our four challenges run by the institution alongside the Railway Challenge, the Design Challenge, and the Apprentice Automation Challenge. They all follow in the footsteps of the institution's highly successful and long-running Formula Student Competition. Um, as someone who's spent their whole career in the automotive sector, uh, I've been involved with the competition pretty much since it started. In fact, the first competition was actually held at a place where I worked called Myra. Um, and uh, since then, I've, I've been a design judge for the competition for many years. So I understand this sort of thing very well. Uh, I went on to become uh, chief judge like Lambert. And um, I did that for many years. And then um, I was also part of the, uh, the organizing team. And I found a member of the team that developed the FSAI. So the, uh, the autonomous vehicle competition of Formula Student three years ago. So if you like, the automotive equivalent of the UAS challenge. Well, as I say, Formula Student's been running for, for over 20 years, uh, and thus far I've seen well over 42,000 competitors, quite a staggering number. Uh, the US challenge is, is a little bit newer than that, knowing it's sixth year, uh, but it's on a strong growth trajectory. And uh, you know, there, are, there are many, many great similarities uh, between the two competitions. So speaking from my perspective and my own personal experience, these competitions produce the best the very best engineers. And if you are fortunate enough to be an employer of someone who's been a competitor, you'll know exactly what I mean. The competition takes academically competent undergraduates and challenges them to work as a team and design and develop a product against a set of criteria, which they then go on to compete with against other university teams from around the world. For many, it's an emotional roller coaster experience, something they will probably remember for their whole lives, to be honest, and for sure, something which many will reference as a significant uh, element of the formation of, of themselves as an engineer. Employers will fight to employ them. And why is that? Well, it's because these competitions do produce the very best engineers, ready to hit the floor running and contribute from day one to the organizations that employ them. And that's because they will have developed lots and lots of skills. Skills to, to work effectively as a team, to create their own organizational structure and leadership, to manage and develop a, um, a project within fixed timescales and budgetary guidelines, and also achieve regulatory compliance. Uh, the rules are deliberately designed to be as open as possible, to enable the teams to be innovative and creative. Uh, and they'll certainly hone their ability to, uh, to solve problems along the way as well. They will have developed skills to create from scratch an elegant, and hopefully efficient engineering design solutions supported by the effective use of analytical modeling tools and then to submit themselves to the scrutiny of the judges as they are challenged on their understanding of the engineering principles behind their designs and the rigor of their decision making rationale. They will also develop skills in how to ensure intrinsic safe operation, giving considerations to the, the environmental impacts of the solution, the sustainability and the application of AI techniques in creating software algorithms and integrating sensor systems and navigation and control systems. They'll have developed skills to manufacture, test, develop and validate their design solutions. And on top of all that, they'll have to be able to communicate and market their solution and develop the commercial skills to be able to reach out and attract sponsors to support both their financing of the team and also where needed to leverage that essential technical expertise and ultimately to develop a commercially sound business proposal. So having developed such a skill set, it's, it's not too difficult to understand why engineers who have transitioned through this process are so employable and go on to enjoy really accelerated career paths. Uh, without doubt, it is this that attracts such high caliber sponsors. And they're very lucky and in fact, we've got some great sponsors. And we're very grateful for them for their involvement and their support, because to be honest, without them, there would not be a UAS challenge. So. Um, we've got a lot to thank them for. The teams are also tasked to, produce, to promote engineering and leverage their experience, enthusiasm and motivation for the, for the competition to inspire the next generation too. So they'll have been challenged to reach out to local schools and place an emphasis on the importance and application of STEM subjects. For the team members, uh, the challenge is an amazing experience. Um, as I've mentioned already, it can be an emotional roller coaster with major highs and lows. Uh, in, in many years of former student, I've seen teams reduced to tears when everything's just gone south, and conversely, enjoying the euphoria of success and the release of a year 
have been tested to the very limits. So I noted that last year's UAS challenge winners uh, were, were the uh, National University of Science and Technology, or NUST for short, from Pakistan. Now, by coincidence, NUST are also regular competitors and no strangers to success in the form of the student competition. And if I was to choose an all-time personal favourite moment uh, from Formula Student, having been involved for mo most of the 20 years, it would be from the Sunday evening prize giving ceremony in 2018. Uh, I was on stage giving out the awards, and that was an award I was giving to, to NUST. So they had won the, um, the Spirit of Formula Student Award. And what was unusual was it was a, an entirely female team of engineers that had designed and built this car and brought it to compete uh, at Silverstone. And they received this award and we, we read out the, the citation, invited them up to the stage and they came up. There's probably about 10, 10 of them all together came up to the stage and they received the award and uh, they turned around to face the audience and they got a standing ovation from 3000 engineers in the audience. And it almost made me cry, to be honest, but it certainly made each and every one of them cry. And it was one of those just magical moments that, uh, that competitions like this can bring. So this year we've had to cope with an unprecedented situation, with a pandemic situation. It's affected all of us, you know, and, it, and it, you know, it's not been great. And we all know that. It's not been a great experience for any of us. Um, and it would have been very easy to just cancel the UAS challenge for 2020. But I'd like to express my appreciation to the organising team uh, for their tenacity in not being beaten by the situation and developing a virtual, let's say, socially distanced version of the competition. Uh, and I know I speak on behalf of all the teams, the sponsors all the other stakeholders, and of course, the institution in expressing our sincere thanks to the organising team for not giving up and showing great resolve to deliver a virtual competition and really showing such true challenge spirit. So enough from me. Um, I'd like to thank all the teams participating this year for all their hard work in what they've done to get to today. I wish them all every success and the very best of luck. And like all of you, I'm looking forward to hearing who the successful teams for the UAS Challenge 2020 are. And I'll now hand back to Paul and the team to uh, to tell us some more. Thank you very much, Terry. Uh, thank you. Really interesting, useful words there. Thank you. And uh, thanks for your support uh, again during these very difficult times. And uh, yes, so we'll see how we can move the competition forwards and, and today's uh, um, award ceremony. So uh, so now we move on to uh, to Lambert uh, Doppler Kepenstall, who's the, the chief judge. Um, he will now give a, a view from the judges, uh, judges uh, situation from his view and also the judges comments. Uh, over to you Lambert. Thank you Paul and uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening wherever you are in the world. Now under normal circumstances um, your design review documents would just have been part of the process to find the winners of the 13 awards that we normally hand out at the demonstration event in June. However, as with the restrictions from the global pandemic, we've had to select winners from the material you've provided us with. But fortunately, we have been able to, to sort out some major awards. Um, these are the design award, which is, is pushed out for the highest aggregate score from your concept paper, PDRs and CDRs and also the highest place new entrant, which uh, is the highest aggregate score for the university that's new to this competition. The safety award is based on the highest scores in the safety section from your BDR and CDRs. And the innovation award, a bit more difficult, but that's been voted on by the panel of judges from the descriptions in your documents. Now, the 10 teams that managed to um, to submit a Dragon's Den video and a Nort poster, um, there we've had a panel of the sponsors have um, judged that, so we're able to make a business proposition and a media engagement award. So all the scores that um, you've um, got from from these various uh, for these various awards will actually be posted in the document library section of the UAS Challenge website. And Christina will send it out to the, the team leaders next week as well. So you should have had feedback from us, technical feedback on your various documents, the concept paper, the PDR and CDR, but you haven't yet had the CDR scores and, and certainly you will see those and all the other scores um, 
on the in the on the website um, very shortly. Now it's been a great pity not to have been able to see all your hard work reaching the flying stage, as well. some pretty promising designs and some pretty diverse designs this year as well. And I'm sure it must have been a major frustration to all of you as well. But we hope you'll have gained some valuable experience and at least reaching the CDR, the critical design review stage. After all, that's the point in a, a design where you, you should be locking it down for manufacture. So you should have completed properly all your design efforts. Um, and undertaking formal design reviews, which we've been trying to encourage you to do, are very critical steps in the design and development process. And it's how the aerospace industry ensures that the safety and airworthiness of its products, as well as addressing the customer requirements. Now, it was good to see in your project plans that many of you were under undertaking subsystem testing early and leaving more time for full system testing because that's the way you really improve your chance of success at the demonstration event. Leaving sufficient time in your program to correct issues you find in testing is absolutely key to a successful outcome. Now, each year, the rules for the competition are updated with the benefit of experience we've had from previous years and to give you some new challenges. This year, there was a greater emphasis on the energy efficiency of the design. Um, there were some changes to the humanitarian aid payload and also some changes to the missions. Now to build a successful product, the first and critically important stage is to capture the customer's requirements. In our case, that's the challenge rules. Now, this should cover both the mandatory requirements and the performance issues that you've identified to give yourself a competitive edge. And that should include a competitive cost. Now, we saw some really good examples of trade-off calculations between airframe and payload carriage to enable you to score maximum points in both the core and optional missions. But remember, we visit these requirements at each stage, each of your review stages, to confirm that your design is not strayed away from these objectives, and particularly that all the mandatory requirements are still being met. Now, very interestingly, your analysis of the requirements this year came up with 20 fixed wing aircraft, seven hybrid designs, we'd have very much liked to have seen a few of those fly, eight rotorcraft, and one helicopter. And all but one of these were fully electrically powered. There is a learning point, I think, for many of you that we were a little bit disappointed in how many of you are not providing all the material requested in the documents, or even following the format that we've asked you to, to follow. Now, it does pay to keep the customer happy by doing what's asked, even if you, you yourself don't see, see entirely the reason for it. And I hope you remember that later in life as you go into industry. Now, we were pleased to see some interesting innovations in manufacturing, some better understanding around safety with some really comprehensive risk assessments and some good ideas for transport boxes. After all, it's all very well building a good product, but you've actually got to get it to the point of use as well. Now, we're pretty confident that all of your designs would have been shot at the missions and indeed provided some very entertaining flying. But I must say, from past experience, we'd be a lot less confident in being able to predict who would have actually come out on top if we had been able to get to the flying event. As it's difficult to judge testing, preparation and teamwork just from paperwork. 
but well done to you all. And we hope that you've gained some very valuable experience in the design and development of a successful aircraft. Now, there's going to be a short comp compilation video now of some of the innovations um, that you've, you've had this year. And then I'll hand back to Paul to introduce the sponsors who will be handing out the awards. So well done, all of you, and have a look at some of these innovations. Moves up to a load of 3.6 G, an asymmetric front which tilts the motor 2 degrees downwards and 2 degrees towards the right hand side compensates the negative effect of the spinning mass of the propeller. With all systems integrated, the fuselage is balanced and the center of gravity is 15 millimeters in front of the center of pressure, which ensures a stable flight. The wing attachment is realized with a quick connector provided by the German company Festo. It is originally a pneumatic part which has been adapted to secure the wing in Y direction. In X and Z direction, it is held in place by two spars which are slid into tubes at the fuse slot. The self-locking quick release fasteners allow installation in just a few moments and in only two steps. Insert the wing connector into the fuselage and then connect the electrical plug. This system allows a high modularity. For example, if the mission objective asks for a faster plane, another set of wings can be attached to optimize for higher speeds and lower payloads. Whilst it could be argued that the use of composite and biodegradable materials qualifies as possessing a degree of innovation, there are two parts of the design which possess truly innovative qualities. The morphing wing shown in the right hand image is a relatively new concept which is essentially unseen in the new UAV market. It alters the geometry of the wing itself instead of relying upon the extendable flaps and ailerons of a conventional wing. This proves advantageous as it theoretically improves overall efficiency by reducing the drag caused by areas of low pressure which occur when airflow separates from an extended wing flap. The airless wheel, shown in the left-hand photo, is 3D printed out of an elastic thermoplastic. Unlike conventional landing gear assemblies, the use of a deformable airless wheel eliminates the need for a dedicated suspension system and removes the risk of punctures to the wheels. This allows for significant weight reduction as no springs or dampers are required, and it also improves the reliability by removing the risk of tyre punctures. the advantage against our competitors, Titan contains key innovations in efficiency, sustainability and ease of use. We developed our own active motor cooling system called Boreas. This consists of an additively manufactured stator with integrated cooling vanes. We utilize computational and traditional engineering methods to further optimize and prototype our system. Finally, we presented our system to a company called Graphite AM, who specialize in additive manufacturing methods, specifically in the additive manufacturing of carbon and graphite. They have agreed to sponsor the production of our system, and this is going to be a very important part of our revenue model. We'll come on to talk about that later. On with our technical process. We have created multiple prototypes during the development process. We started off with a wooden rib structure that would later be covered in PETG, as can be seen in the picture. After that, we moved on to create a fully 3D printable tubular base design made out of PLA and PETG, as can be seen here. We are currently running tests with this design and are planning to extensively test it in the local environment of Malawi this year, October. With regards to the algorithm, we use a combination of edge detection and color detection to determine the position of ground markers and then use a machine learning algorithm to determine the alphanumerical character. Finally, I would like to show you a video of our test flight. What you see here is a video of our first wooden prototype flying and landing automatically.
So I think we can all agree there are some really interesting uh, innovative designs um, that we're starting to see through the competition. Um, and again, a little bit later on, we'll find out uh, from Steve Parker from Megit uh, who, uh, who was doing the best in that area. But as we do now, we're going to move uh, into the actual award ceremony itself. Um, I'll, I'll just now step through the, the various, as I go through, we'll go through the awards um, uh, and I'll introduce the, 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 the award givers as we get to them. Firstly, as you can see, it's business proposition and Stephen Phillips from Bombardier will present uh, the, the business proposition award uh, for today. Over to you, Stephen. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so a bit of a change from um, reviewing the Dragon's Ends this year. Um, 10 teams submitted videos of their presentations. Um, and you could definitely see that there's much better quality this year, given the times had team, uh, the teams had time to work on it. Uh, the purpose of the Dragon's Den um, review is to uh, try and link real world economics to the UAV development. So teams have to go away and have a look at what are their target markets, the revenue model, their sales projections, and how their US fits in that market. Um, as I said, the quality was pretty good this year. Um, I have to give some um, accommodations to uh, runner-up teams, uh, University of Huddersfield, University of Lockborough, and Queen's University had very good uh, efforts. Uh, but this year's winner was uh, Team Ants, um, and we're showing their, uh, their video up next. Uh, congratulations, Team Ants. In the mid-afternoon of 20th May 2020, a powerful and deadly tropical cyclone, Amphan, hit the coastal areas of Bangladesh and eastern India, affecting about thousands of people. Like before, the effect of this humanitarian disaster would last for a long time. This is because of two reasons. Firstly, the post-storm disaster. This includes rising water in the coastal areas, leading to flood in the low-lying coast. Every year, 10,000 square miles, which is 18% of the total land mass of the country, gets flooded, affecting 7 million houses. Secondly, the infrastructural limitations of the country. Disaster response services are few and poorly equipped. The exact number of people trapped cannot be identified and many die off the records. On the other hand, another nightmare for the people of poorly planned urban cities like Dhaka, Chittagong is traffic congestion. Five million working hours are wasted per day in Dhaka for traffic congestion. This is one of the prominent reasons for which disaster response teams cannot reach the disaster zone and ambulances cannot reach the hospitals. Poor road connectivity also a threat to many other people in certain cases, just like 64-year-old COVID-19 patient, Ramat Ali, in the remote village of Rampur, who can be saved by supplying blood plasma from a COVID-recovered patient available in the capital, Dhaka. The trip is seven hours by road, and since there are no domestic flights available, hiring a helicopter is heavily expensive. An unmanned aerial system can be an effective way to identify the distress in Christ's moment of cyclone, flood, or earthquake and deliver supplies to the victims in need. The Freedom 71 or F 71 insured by Team Ants is a fixed and electric propulsion unit with dual propellers and conventional field configuration. Two of our farms and aerial system we will provide services to four different sectors, which include emergency disaster response, package delivery, vehicle zero mapping, and journalism. Hubs will be set up at eight prime locations of the country Dhaka, Joshua, Komilla, Chitagong, Rajshai, Rampur, Manashi, and Silla. The network will be able to serve 64 districts of the country. For example, Shatria, one of the most affected regions hit by Cyclone Alpha, has limited air access for response teams to track down victims with an aircraft. According to a network plan, community emergency response teams served may dispatch UAs from three nearby houses, Joshua, Chilagong, and Borishal, for a 60 million computer spike surveillance of southern Bangladesh. F-71 being a fixed wing UA is faster and allows minimum energy consumption and maximum flight time than a multi rover UA. This allows people who might be trapped in one of the areas to be identified easily. Cruising at a maximum speed of 86 knots, the F-71 can operate for more than an hour to distances of 100 kilometers from the hubs. 
This is the zones can be inspected through our visual imaging camera, and that's what we want with high clarity, thanks to its low stop speed of great renals during the daytime. Additional thermal imaging and night vision cameras ensure identification at night time. F71 also ensures quick reception of delivering emergency packages. Mounting the package and getting the UR ready for dispatch is a matter of just 10 minutes, which means that the blood plasma required by Ramatullah may be delivered from Dhaka to Rangpur in just under an hour as compared to the seven hours road trip, serving as a much cheaper and faster alternative. The F71 utilizes EPS own, making it lightweight and enabling it to carry heavier payloads. Carbon fiber used as power rod also ensures maximum durability and strength. Glass fiber used with resin in the wing ensures water resistance, allowing the UA to move through a rate weather conditions. Other than emergency disaster response and package delivery, and serial system will be providing services to two other sectors, agriculture mapping and journalism. The agriculture sector contributes more than 20% in the GDP of Bangladesh and involves 41% of the entire labor. This sector is largely based on the cultivation of rice, which is about 75% of the cultivation and sums up to the 10.5 million hectares. The government monitors the annual crop yield throughout the year from the annual agricultural statistic from the previous years. Surveillance is required for the statistic. This surveillance often engages a lot of time and a huge labor. This is where F71 can play its vital role. The F71 would be taking flight over the crop fields, capturing multispectral images. The images will be meshed and processed with RTP GPS data to create NDVI images. Where it might take a week or a month to collect data, F71 alone can collect all the data in a single flight through a visual imaging, thanks again to its slow stall speed of 22 knots over a long route. The F71 can be implemented as a journalism scenario of the country as well. Any massive incident like a fire breakout is a breaking news within a short time. News agencies often hog the spot with their vans and equipment, making it difficult for the rescue services to operate. This may be simply solved by the use of aerial photography. And since use of helicopters is expensive in the country, our F71 can be the savior. Compared to the chopper, it will be much convenient and economically feasible to send our UA for aerial photography. The business will be operated from eight different hubs around the country, consisting of 60 UA adapted for four different applications and will be distributed among the hubs according to area and demand. The total manufacturing cost of 60 UA will be $330,000, considering the primary operation cost, which includes monthly rents of office space, salaries, utilities, technical equipment, and miscellaneous. The total cost of the first year comes to $780,000. From the second year onward, the expected annual expenditure will be $530,000. The whole operation will require an initial investment of $590,000, which will be raised from seed funding and campaigns for stakeholders. The target market is divided into four sectors. Our relevant customer can be fire brigade, NGOs, and other emergency units for emergency response service, blood bank, courier companies, and hospital for package delivery, for agriculture mapping, Bangladesh Rice Research Institute, and similar organization along with fertilizer companies, news agencies, and television channels for aerial journalism. Initially, we will launch two services, leasing a UA for a monthly cost of $1,060, and on-demand package delivery, the cost of which will be based on distance and duration. So for delivering blood for Romantali from Dhaka to Rongpur, it will cost an average of only $120, which is a far more economic alternative. Based on market analysis and daily demand, it is expected that 30 UA will be leased and 240 on-demand package delivery will be completed monthly, generated an average annual revenue stream of around $720,000 and can reach a maximum of $850,000 if all our units remain easy throughout the year. At this phase, the firm will reach the break-even point by the second year of operation. The firm will also open to direct sale of EUA for large-scale projects. We will implement our expansion plan after three years once the company has required a certain brand value. We made significant progress before the world made the pandemic. The design of the EUA made from scratch and it has undergone significant remodeling over the past few months. F71 has been designed with minimal interlocking parts akin to a puzzle which can be easily be dismantled into segments and assembled into a complete UA quite easily without assembling any screws or nut bolts. COTS equipment was ordered and shipped, most activities being carried out following the project timeline. Specific parts of the UA were designed with topology optimization, which ensured the increased weight ratio to maximize capacity for carrying the load. The team simultaneously worked on developing algorithms and different subsystem design, including control subsystem, communication and navigation subsystem. Our latest success on development was a fabrication and manual test flight software prototype data. 
the team developed a homegrown CNC machine and custom software of the CNC for generating G code from VAT files and ultimately passing them to the CNC. Our heat package will be bundled using custom fabricated joke netting, which, if disposed, will decompose accomplishing the SDG goals set by UN. We decided to utilize Jute since it is a part of our national heritage and most importantly biodegradable. Prior to the manufacturing and testing phase, we use software in the loop, simulation with estimated data of F71, thereby giving us scopes of development on our UI. Even before manufacturing, considering the limitation of test flight zones, SITL was used for verification of algorithms, helping successful flight simulations to avoid crash. Team ANS has been working relentlessly for inspiring and engaging young minds in engineering and technology. On February 1st, the ANS STEM outreach program was launched. This involved carrying seminars and workshops in several educational institutions like schools and colleges in order to encourage students in the field of science and technology. Young students were taught about the basic working of a UA, the prospect of UAS in our country, modern the application of robotics and so on. Moreover, the program served well to acknowledge the students to know more about the IMAKI and the US challenge, as well as help the team gain more supporters. The team provided custom notebooks and stickers to everyone who took part in the workshop as a token of appreciation. The initial plan was to cover 38 different institutions, and we successfully completed our session in 15 institutions before the coronavirus emergency. Team AMS is also affiliated with renowned club associations of educational institutions around the nation, along with IMAKI IB student chapter, and has been constantly highlighted as the first ever team from Bangladesh to take part in the IMAKI US challenge. As for the social media, regular posts were posted on Facebook and Instagram about the insights of the challenge, aerospace news and facts, updates about stakeholders and other related information with the hashtag DLFANS to ensure maximum reach. Our Facebook page has more than 1,800 active followers and the Instagram page has nearly 200 followers. Our team and project has been featured on national news channels like News24 and Channel I. The team was featured on Facebook Live interview by a very popular online learning program, Chogbur, in Bangladesh. Team ANS has already been working with government bodies like the Civil Aviation Authority of Bangladesh and the National Tech Carrier, Biman Bangladesh Airlines, to discuss the prospects of UAS in the country. While we are still far away from establishing the idea in our economy, with due dedication and a lot of willpower, ANS will achieve newer and greater horizons. So uh, well done there to Team Ants, well, in fact, to all the, the teams that uh, the 10 teams that put in their business uh, proposition, uh, Dragons and Videos, excellent, and, and Team Ants, that was an absolutely outstanding video. So well done indeed. So now we, we turn to the next award. Uh, this award is going to be presented by Joe Allen, who is the uh, media lead on the UAS Challenge, and it's the Media and Engagement Award. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, Paul. Um, so I just... Firstly, I'd like to start off by reiterating why we give out this award. And it's really to set everyone off on the path um, to, be, to becoming great ambassadors for the engineering profession and the technology industry. And that's what we really need right now is, is more engagement and more people interested in this industry so we can come together as a community and make strides forward. Um, the Media Engagement Award was judged based on the posters that the team submitted and also um, the videos where we asked them to put in some experiences um, of their social media and STEM engagement. And the winners this year, um, apart from keeping our iMacy staff, especially Christina, busy with plenty of questions, um, well, they showed fantastic initiative in setting up a STEM outreach program um, and demonstrated their commitment to increasing the profile of engineering in their region. Uh, they had a fantastic social media presence and there were speeches in the local and national press which brought news of their experiences and their successes to a wider audience. And actually, they've just been telling you about it themselves. <laughs> so, congratulations to the Islamic um, University of Technology from Bangladesh, Team Ants, who've won the Media and Engagement Award for 2020. Um, congratulations also to Huddersfield, University of Huddersfield, Team Hawk. 
they were highly commended um, for a multifaceted approach to their engagement with um, in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, engagement with industry and on social media. So again, thanks um, to all teams who've been active on social media and um, yeah, making the chat, spreading news of the challenge and well done again to Team Ants. Thank you, Joe. And yeah, again, excellent. Uh, thank you to T uh, well done to Team Ants uh, for that. Again, we saw uh, the, the level of media engagement that we in your video there. So it really was outstanding. And again, just backing up what uh, what Joe has just said there. So a number of you had asked how if you can get copies of the videos that we've been showing. Just to say that uh, soon as the uh, shortly after the, the uh, ceremony, we'll provide the links to those videos uh, on the website uh, and also through the various social media uh, platforms that we're on. We'll send the links as well so you can see those videos and, and obviously the other ones are the other ones you didn't get to see today uh, available there so please check that out when you, you've uh, when you're finished so now we can move to the to next award and this award uh, is going to be presented by steve parker from megit and it's award for, for the, the best innovation over to you steve you are um, so one of the key things in the UAS activity is that alongside sound engineering practice in, in designing, building and, and flying new aircraft, innovation is a key driver in the challenge. Um, every year there are, there are novel and interesting solutions to the, uh, to the challenge that is set and this year is no different to any other. The big difference this year is much harder to judge. It's always difficult um, in any case, but this year with the COVID-19 disruptors has been much more difficult than usual. So it's been a bit of a challenge, but the uh, the judging panel put their minds to it. And um, there's two teams I wanted to mention. Um, University of 20, Team A3T, they approached the innovation challenge looking at the overall design of their vehicle with a blended wing tilt rotor with novel features incorporated to provide great flexibility of the aircraft um, to, uh, with range and duration offered by, uh, by the wing and body lift during the forward flight but with vertical takeoff capability. Um, to maximizing the efficiency, the vertical stabilizers are located beneath the aircraft and double as landing skids, which means there's no need for separate landing gear, which saves weight and also drag. And there's also innovation in manufacturing with a, a novel application of PETG thermoplastic forming in conjunction with the printed ribs to uh, form the aircraft skin. Um, the, the second team I wanted to mention is Huddersfield Team Hawk. We just got another mention in the uh, previous category. There are a number of innovations in their design with a morphing wing, as I think we saw earlier in the, in the innovation videos that were shown, um, which is actually echoes quite a lot of research which is going on in the wider aerospace industry. The novel wheel design was also very interesting, again, saving weight and drag on the aircraft, um, borrowing and adapting technology from, from ground vehicles, which is um, a, a absolutely valid thing to do in innovation. But judging was a very close run thing, uh, both teams deserving of praise for creativity and innovation, but ultimately the prize has gone to the University of 20 team A3T for a, a very well deserved prize and highly com highly commended for Huddersfield Team Hawk. So thanks very much for all your efforts to all of the teams who entered and uh, added innovations into their designs. And congratulations to University of 20 Team A3T. Thank you, Steve. Uh, and I'll just, yes, echo that. Uh, well done to the University of 20 Team A3T for, for winning the uh, Innovation Award. And again, the others who got a special mention there, well done indeed. And again, we saw some of the others in the video a little bit earlier on. So next, we move on to the award uh, for safety. And this will be presented by Rod Williams, who's the uh, Challenges Chief Scrutineer. So over to you, Rod, for the safety award. Hello. Um, yes, I'm Rod Williams from Fraser Nash Consultancy, um, sponsoring the safety award. Um, as uh, Paul said, I'm also the Chief Scrutineer for UAS Challenge, so I have a keen interest in the airworthiness and safety aspects of the designs submitted for the competition. Um, and indeed, the scrutineering team normally enjoy observing you as teams in the pit lanes and on the flight line to see how you safely prepare, maintain and operate your UAS. 
but this year the safety prize is awarded to the team that has shown the strongest approach to safety management through their design review submissions and it's awarded to Brunel Unmanned Aerial Systems. This team top scored on both the PDR and the CDR and showed a strong and consistent approach to safety and its incorporation in the design of their UAS to ensure airworthiness and safe operation throughout. Key to their CDR submission was a good risk matrix, which contained the key hazards and indicated their levels of risk. This was clearly set out using a color-coded chart of likelihood versus se severity, including risk to health and safety during manufacture, technical airworthiness, and air safety in flight. An excellent overall approach to safety followed from the matrix, thus allowing them to identify and mitigate technical risks in all phases, both of design and operation. I would also like to mention several other teams who made strong submissions following similar principles, particularly the Open University, UCL DroneX, Imperial College London, and the University of Huddersfield Team Hawk. By identifying effective controls, they were able to make an appropriate ALARP assessment covering the full life cycle of the UAS, from design and manufacture, through qualification and testing, to operation and maintenance. Critically, the need for repeatable procedures and checklists as well as recording data for analysis and improvement were recognised, all vital elements of maintaining airworthiness and flight safety and minimising risk to life. So well done to all the teams who entered. Uh, a good understanding of safety awareness and effective risk, man risk management were shown throughout. And congratulations to Brunel Unmanned Aerial Systems in winning the safety award. Thank you, Rod, for that. Yes, and indeed, well done to Brown University Team Bruas uh, for winning the safety award uh, this year. So now we move on to the next award. So the next award will be presented by Simon Jones from Leonardo uh, for the highest placed new entrants. Uh, over to you, Simon. We appear to be having some technical differences there. Hello, Simon, can you hear us? Uh, it does help if you turn your microphone on. <laughs> Excellent. It happens every time. There you go, Simon. Over to you. <laughs> OK, I'll start again. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone for wherever you are in the world, and uh, welcome to the uh, IMECI Awards Ceremony. I would just like to say uh, my thanks to IMECI for putting this on. Um, for all of us, it's obviously challenging times. Um, congratulations to all 36 teams that, that took part in this. As I said, during challenging times for all of us in the world and certainly unprecedented. And I'm sure you've all had to adapt your ways of working, um, which I guess uh, some novel approaches, uh, which is obviously what uh, what UAS is all about as well. So it's. Uh, it's yeah. It, it's certainly been uh, interesting times for everyone. Um, it's a real shame for me personally, as probably being one of the few non-engineers on uh, on this award ceremony, that we didn't get a chance to see the uh, the fruits of your labours. Um, I was involved uh, with the uh, challenge last year for the first time, and it was certainly great to see the innovation and uh, the the passion that you all show for what what you've been working so hard to produce. And um, it's also, obviously, from my perspective, great to, to speak to some young, enthusiastic people that, uh, that work in the environment that I'm involved in on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is, uh, so I guess I'll make my announcement of who, who the award is, or who the winner of this award is for the uh, highest placed new entrant. And um, having seen the uh, video that they showed earlier, and um, this is the uh, third prize that they're picking up today. So to Team Ants uh, from the Islamic University of Technology, congratulations. And I was uh, super impressed with the video I saw earlier. So uh, award number three from uh, from a, a new new entrant. I think uh, some of the teams that have been in this for, for a while, uh, we've got someone hot on your heels here. So well done. Thank you, Simon. And I think I'd agree on that one, Team Ants. So well done, your, your third prize. Again, uh, some excellent work by the team there, uh, and well done indeed for your highest place new entrant. 
uh, this, this year. So now we move uh, to the final uh, award for this year's uh, challenge. Um, and this year it's the design awards. So this again is our, the bringing together, as, as Lambert said, of all the various paperwork and, and our aspects together to effectively to our overall winner. Uh, obviously, we haven't been the fly off this event, so this, this constitutes the design winner. So this this year, uh, this will be presented by Malcolm Foster from GK and Aerospace. Uh, Malcolm, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? <laughs> okay, over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. So engineering is clearly very important to GKN, uh, and the design prize is awarded to the team that scores best on an aggregate of the concept paper, the preliminary design review, and the critical design review submissions. Uh, each of these is scored on criteria, including the design process, project management, innovation, analysis, cost, safety, manufacturing, and test, and on how clearly the understanding of those is expressed by the team. So the design is as much about understanding the engineering process as it is about the quality of the product final design. Queen's University Belfast did an excellent job of describing and following a robust design process throughout the year, including stringent requirements management. They received the highest scores in both the concept paper and the PDR, and they ranked very highly in the CDR, where they were particularly strong in their detailed structural analysis, the aerodynamic design of the airframe, and their system design, in particular, the propulsion design analysis. It's not entirely about the design process, though, and it's important to recognize that their hard work has also resulted in what would likely have been a very competitive aircraft design in any normal year. Um, this was by no means an easy win, though, as, as Queen's had very stiff competition, in particular from Huddersfield, Bangladesh, and Southampton, who each demonstrated real strengths at different points in the year. Queen's Belfast, however, succeeded through consistently scoring very highly all year long. So congratulations to Queen's University Belfast for winning this year's design award. Yes, indeed. Well and done indeed to Queen's University uh, Fly Mech uh, team for, for winning the design awards. Your excellent work uh, gets you to this point. So well done indeed. So that uh, concludes the uh, the awards for this year, the uh, 2020 UAS Challenge. Uh, I'll next hand over to uh, Joe Horton, who's the uh, operations members operations director uh, for the institution, just to give a uh, some closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Paul. Can I just check that you can hear me? I can hear you. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, um, as Paul said, my name's uh, Jo Horton and I work uh, for the institution, have done for many years, and I'm currently the Director of Member Operations. And, and my role and that of um, Elaine and Christina, who are, who are very much part of this uh, team to make this happen today, are, are here to try and ensure that the members' experience and, and uh, value for, for their membership is there. And we try to put on a huge range of activities throughout the year. And this one certainly has been, by no means has been uh, a fantastic event. Um, I'm really grateful to be invited here along today to participate in the award ceremony um, and also the opportunity to some, see some fantastic designs and innovations in this year's competition. Um, even though it's uh, online this time, I really got a feel for what you guys had been involved with and what you'd done over the last number of months. Thank you all for participating and congratulations to you all, not, not just, just, just the winners. You all deserve a huge round of applause. I'm not sure we can give one to everybody, but um, you certainly deserve one for making this challenge happen in the first place in some very challenging times. So well done uh, to all those involved. As Terry highlighted right at the beginning, uh, 36 teams is fantastic from 10 countries. And um, I'm truly impressed at the global nature of this competition. And like, I'd like to see more of that uh, across the institution. Um, and it's great to have the new 10 teams on board. And I hope uh, personally that you enjoyed the experience, um, perhaps if a little different from what you were originally expecting. If you think about it, this compares to 12 teams right at the beginning and concept of, of the challenge. I think some from five years ago, back in 2014 slash 15 when it started. And it's really great to see the challenge go from strength to strength. And I do hope um, that it will uh, in future years and the IMACE will continue to support that. I think I've also been really impressed today and across the last few months at uh, the, the resilience of us, of, of you all and, and the innovation that's taken place, not just in your designs, but also in making, making uh, this event happen. Um, 
under some really difficult circumstances and it's a great achievement. I think innovation itself is key to this industry to tackle some of the global challenges and the UAS challenge in particular provides a platform just to do that, uh, for new ideas to be made into reality, as well as providing hopefully you with the necessary skill sets, both in soft skills and with engineering to help progress in your careers. Um, with the arrival of, of the coronavirus pandemic, the use of unmanned aircraft has become even more important in this world uh, for services that perhaps we would never envisaged uh, three to four months ago. Um, I think it's really interesting times going forward to see how future transport policies that will now consider unmanned aircraft and how it fits into the overall movement of goods and services, not only to achieve environmental sustainable systems, but also to support you know, people in real need as, it, as was um, presented during some of the videos today. And we also hope that you've had fun. The whole point of this is, is to work as, as part of a team, to involve others, uh, et cetera. So we hope you've not only developed your skills, but you've had fun along the way, made you new connections. And also I think for all of you, made your universities very proud of you. Um, and we're all, I think, really raring to go for 2021. I think this could, puts us in good stead. Um, and I hope for those who are listening that haven't been part of the competition uh, potentially that it's inspired you to get involved or do more in your local community. There are a huge number of people to thank throughout this and I'm going to leave that to Yelena to do that in, in, a, in a couple of moments. But I would certainly personally like to thank everyone involved from the students to the judges, the sponsors to the volunteer committees and not least the staff. Uh, I've always liked working in a team, and this just shows the benefits of, of teamwork. It's really, really important. And my last thought I would, I'd like to leave with you is if you've enjoyed your experience with the challenge, then please stick around. Uh, this challenge has probably been a way to get to know the institution a bit better and what it um, can offer. Um, but please be aware there's lots of other opportunities across the organisation where we can hopefully support you as you go into the workplace, as you progress your career that we can still support you. And also at some point uh, to give back to your sector, uh, hopefully the aerospace sector that you will, you will work in eventually, but also your local communities, which is an important part of what IMACI is all about. So once again, uh, from me and behalf of uh, everyone involved and for the institution, um, I'd like to say congratulations and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Um, and I will hand over now to Yelena, who's gonna give the vote of thanks. Hi everybody, I think that you can all hear me. Um, I want to start by thanking the teams. Without you, we wouldn't have a competition and be here today. So thank you for taking part. Thank you for all of your hard work. Thank you for remaining engaged and for participating in our virtual competition. Your digital certificates will be emailed to you next week alongside feedback forms. So please do fill those in and send them back to us so we can keep improving and growing the competition. I would like to thank our sponsors, GKN, Aerospace, Megat, Leonardo, Bombardier and Mishum. Thank you not only for your financial support, which enables us to keep the competition running, but for getting involved in each and every part of the challenge and for the opportunities you provide the students throughout the cycle and thereafter in their careers. I would also like to thank our other industry partners for their support, for the time and dedication it has taken to develop the rules, judge team submissions, and to assist with your expert advice. I would like to thank the organizing committee and the wider group of volunteers that work on the competition with us for freely giving up their time and using their expertise to help the IMECI develop the next generation of engineers. Thank you for bearing with us as we adapted the competition through COVID, um, for all of the extra meetings and for continuing to work with us to develop the US challenge. I would like to thank the IMECI team for their hard work. And in particular, my colleague, Christina Berkelich for her professionalism, dedication and kindness. It is a pleasure to work with you and a pleasure to have you involved in the competition. Last but not least, I would like to thank Paul Lloyd, our chair. You bring all of the different elements of the competition together and keep everything running smoothly. 
Thank you for making time for us, which I know is no small task, and for providing us with your leadership and guidance. You're a true professional and a true credit to the competition. Everybody, thank you very much and congratulations. Well, thank you very much, Elena, for those, those kind words. And clearly, I need to say thank you as well to, to you, Elena, for your, your outstanding support throughout the year, both you and Christina. Without you, again, we absolutely, the committee could not organise the, the event. Uh, the sponsors would, would, would be pulled together. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, and, as, and as you said, to thanks to the teams uh, for, for your work, again, and your support. Um, hopefully, many of your universities will carry on uh, next year uh, to, to, to join the competition, which I'm sure we'll talk about it in, in a second, we'll plan for next year. Uh, and again, hopefully we will see uh, you in person again um, next year as well. That, that will be clearly uh, a, you know, a real achievement. So turning to, to the next year's challenge, as we finish the award ceremony now, and again, well done to all the teams involved, all the hard work, and again, uh, particularly Team Ants, who, uh, who have done particularly well this, this year. But also to uh, to all the teams who submitted their paperwork and the designs and put all that hard work into it. As I said, importantly, hopefully it was both an enjoyable as well as um, you know, an, an experience of, of learning about engineering and working in the um, aerospace sector. And again, I wish those are certainly those are leaving the university uh, best of luck in your careers. Um, and as uh, as was mentioned certainly by Joe, uh, we always look for volunteers and we always have a number of ex team members coming back to help us out the volunteering so again uh through christine and elena always keen to hear from people who'd like to come and help us out next year and going forwards so for next year's challenge uh, the rules are, are being pulled together so that they're, they're ready to go um i'll maybe i'll bring a couple of items out about what we're planning for next year before i do that i should clearly say uh, we are still as, as we are in the midst of, of the of the pandemic um, one hopes um, that it that it is uh, coming to an end. Uh, one hopes that life will begin to start returning to normal uh, fairly soon. Uh, but clearly, we don't know, uh, and every day generates uh, new challenges and uh, a new no dynamics for us to, to deal with. So, because of that, we're obviously going to have to uh, keep very flexible in the way we look for next year's challenge. Uh, we're committed as, as an organising team to to move forward with the challenge, but we just need to see what the environment will be. Uh, both from a, an economic or financial environment, but certainly to the universities and the teams and their abilities to to move forward next year and into the, into the next term and, and how that work is going to carry on the semester. So again, I was just say, please keep an eye on the website. We'll keep talking to, to teams. We'll keep you informed of plans. But again, we just don't know. But we've got a few really exciting ideas coming forward for next year. Uh, the, the, pub, the rules have been published, so hopefully you've, uh, you've, uh, you've had a chance to read them. And some pretty extensive revisions uh, based upon team feedback uh, and from sponsors about how we can continue to develop this this exciting competition. Uh, we'll carry on, and this year we'll, we'll, we were planning to have the event at uh, BMFA at Buckminster again, a little bit more central uh, than than previous years at Clambetter, but again, how about an outstanding, as you can see from the pictures, uh, site. Uh, Buckminster again offers some excellent facilities, uh, maybe a little bit more uh, central than, than we've done before. And again, we're really hopeful that we can actually uh, actually attend uh, next sort of June time uh, in there, or all, all, all being well. We're going to absolutely continue focusing on innovation. Certainly, something that's come up a number of times in the presentations uh, uh, there. That innovation is absolutely key to this sector. So again, we're increasing the mass limit to ten kilos as you wear to, to, to allow some more innovations. Revised submissions with a range of challenges pitched both for the less experienced and the most capable of teams, uh, as we see. Quite often, some of the newer teams are doing really rather well. So, uh, yes, keeping others on their toes at all times. We're looking to get hopefully get sponsorship from uh, the humanity, humanitarian and air company air Dropbox to, to again to to move forward with this uh, their technology, and again, uh, kind of exclusive, uh, and more inclusive again for first and second year students again to hopefully bring that competition on and get you involved at an early stage. More agile design reviews again, trying to reduce your paperwork burden. Uh, as Lambert mentioned, but very important we keep that as an absolutely uh, critical part of working in the aerospace sector and as an engineer. It's important that we do keep that uh, side of the business going. But again, uh, hopefully just streamlining that a little bit for you. Environmental and design efficiency is always going to be focus. We'll always keep environmental aspects. And again, something we're going to be measuring power consumption. So again, making sure we're looking for efficiencies and environmental um, concerns in your designs as, as you move forward. But also, uh, hopefully, uh, again, all being well, we'll, we'll be able to run 
power of flight lines for much more flying uh, than we've been able to do previously, uh, again, weather permitting, but again, hopefully we'll do there. So those are just, I think, some key points I wanted to bring out for next year. As I said, we are in a very difficult, challenging time. Uh, who knows uh, what's going to happen over the coming months? Hopefully, uh, we'll be returning to normality, but please keep an eye out on the website and certainly in terms of registration and details about what the competition will look like next year, but we'll be out uh, early uh, after the summer break, so early into, into September, we'll be sending out uh, details of the timetable for the challenge and, and what will be what the challenge will be. So please keep an eye on the website for those details. So I think that concludes the uh, the uh, chat, the, uh, the virtual award ceremony today. So thank you very much for everybody taking part. Thank you to um, all those uh, panel members and participants uh, who've been able to join us and, and give out the awards today. Uh, the technology mostly worked, so well done to all of us for that, for making that work. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to everybody. And um, hopefully until next year when we will do this in person, not virtually, um, good luck and uh, keep safe. Thank you very much indeed.